the factor group associated with a normal subgroup n is called g mod n, and it consists of the cosets of that normal subgroup themselves behaving as a group in and of their own right. There are going to be a way for us to solve the missing factor problem. If I want to understand a larger group as a product of a normal subgroup with something else, that factor group is going to be the something else in that equation. In this video, we want to take a look at some of the elementary properties of factor groups that we can learn from these definitions. For starters, the hunt for normal subgroups, as we've seen in our extra video a couple of videos ago, is a hunt for unions of conjugacy classes that form subgroups. Problem is, conjugacy classes are not always easy to understand, and even when we can take unions of them, we don't always get subgroups. So, do we know that normal subgroups are going to exist in general out in the world? Well, for any group, no matter how messy and complicated it is, there's always two examples of a normal subgroup for G. One example is G itself, and the other example is the identity element. Those are the cases in which cosets of N inside of G are going to form a group. When N is the whole group itself, that makes the entire group a single coset, and therefore the factor group is just the trivial group. On the other hand, when N is the trivial subgroup, the cosets are exactly single element sets inside of G, and therefore the cosets form a group which is isomorphic to G itself. And the number of cosets is always equal to the index in G of the normal subgroup N. So that index is going to be the order of the factor group. And so according to Lagrange's theorem, when those orders are finite, the order of the factor group is going to be the quotient of the order of the larger group by the order of the normal subgroup. So the first two things that I just talked through that are always true about factor groups is that when I take the quotient of a group by itself, so G mod G, uh, I always get a single element group, in other words, a trivial group. Conversely, if I take the quotient of the group G with the trivial subgroup, I always get a factor group which is isomorphic to G itself. So it's the intermediate cases that get more interesting. And there are groups out in the world for which there are no intermediate normal subgroups. There's no normal subgroup which is smaller than the entire group, nor larger than the trivial group itself. Those groups that have nothing in between are called the simple groups. Uh, and so what we'll find out as we get a little further on into our system here is that if I'm looking to classify finite groups, the finite simple groups are going to be those that are going to form the most essential indecomposable building blocks on which we can build larger finite groups. Okay, so what else can we learn? We can learn, for example, that if I take a external direct product of two groups, G and H, that there's always a normal subgroup of that, which is isomorphic to G, and that the quotient of the product by G forms a factor group, which is isomorphic to H. So this is kind of like the cancellation property that we would expect from any reasonable multiplication and division, any reasonable product and quotient. If I take the product and then the quotient by one of the factors of that product, that quotient should give me the other factor in that product. Let's look at what a proof of that statement might look like. First of all, in what sense is G a normal subgroup in this external direct product? Well, we're going to think of that as being the subgroup which is made up of the elements of G in the first component of my ordered pair, and in the second component of my ordered pair, I place the identity element of H. And that is going to give me a subgroup of the direct product, which is isomorphic to G, just by sending this element from this first factor to the corresponding element of G. But then why is that a normal subgroup, and why is the quotient isomorphic to H? So let's take a look at uh, picking up any element of this subgroup, um, so any element of the subgroup G crossed with uh, the identity element of H, that's going to take the form G prime comma EH for some G prime inside of the group G. And if I take any other element of my larger group, G plus H, we'll show that when we conjugate X by this element GH, that that result remains an element of my subgroup. So to conjugate it, I'll just take GH multiplied by X multiplied by the inverse of GH. But when I do out that arithmetic, I get something which has in its first entry g times g prime times g inverse. And in the second entry, I get h times the identity element of the group h times the inverse of h. So I get this ordered pair. 
But when I simplify that ordered pair, I get some nasty conglomeration of elements of g on the left factor. But on the right factor, I get h times the identity element times h inverse, which, because the identity property, cancels out to just become the identity element of h once again. And so this new element is some element of g, comma, the identity element of h, and therefore it belongs to my subgroup. Therefore, my subgroup is closed under conjugation, which is why we can say that this subgroup is a normal subgroup of the external direct product. Now, why is the quotient isomorphic to h? Remember, the quotient is the group whose elements are the cosets of my subgroup inside of my larger group. So how do I discover the isomorphism between h and the cosets of this subgroup inside of my larger group? Well, any coset, gh, times my subgroup, I can just send to the element h inside of the group h. And you can check that this is an isomorphism um, because it's a bijection going both ways. I can send an element h back into this element, identity of g comma h times this. So this particular coset comes from h and then vice versa. If we show that this has the homomorphism property, which is not difficult to convince yourself of, then that proves that um, this group of cosets of my subgroup is in fact isomorphic to h. So products and quotients have this cancellation property uh, up to isomorphism. The next interesting fact that we can discover about factor groups is that factor groups are fairly constrained in the kind of structure that they can have. And here's how. Uh, if I take the factor group of G by the center of G, the first thing that that makes us think is, how do we know the center of G is going to be a normal subgroup of G? Um, that you can convince yourself of pretty quickly just by remembering that the elements in the center of a group, the elements in ZG, commute with everything in G. And so their left cosets are going to be the same thing as their right cosets just because of that friendly commutativity. So since the center of G is a normal subgroup of G, we can form the factor group, G mod the center of G. And this theorem says that the only way for that factor group to be cyclic is for the original group to have been abelian, which sounds a little bit weird, because after all, a group which is abelian is equal to its own center. G is equal to ZG when G is abelian. And therefore, when G is abelian, it's equal to its center, and that means that this quotient, G mod the center, cannot be cyclic unless it's trivial. So that's really the content of what this theorem is saying, that the only way for the quotient of a group by its own center to be cyclic is for it to be trivial and therefore for the whole group to be abelian. So what does this proof look like? If we take the forward direction in which we first assume that G is an abelian group, I want to then show that G modulo the center of G uh, must be cyclic. But on the other hand, if G is abelian, then G is equal to its own center. And therefore, by property number one up here, the quotient g mod zg is the same as g mod g, and that's trivial. But the trivial group is trivially a cyclic group of order one, and therefore the forward direction is simple. Any abelian group is going to have its quotient by its own center be cyclic, because in particular, that quotient is the trivial group. Okay, what about going the other way? If I happen to know that G mod the center of G is a cyclic group, how do we then prove that that must mean G must have been abelian? Well, let's think about uh, this quotient being a cyclic group generated by an element. Remember, the elements of a quotient group are cosets. Therefore, I'm going to pick a coset of ZG. I'm going to call it AZG. And that's going to be the element which generates G mod ZG. So the picture that I have here is that I've got my factor group over here, g mod zg, and I've got a generator of it because I'm assuming that it's a cyclic group. Well, that generator corresponds to an element in my original group g, and the coset associated with that element is what we think of as the element in this factor group. All right, so now I need to show g is abelian. So I need to pick any elements x and y inside my group, arbitrarily, and show that xy is equal to yx. Well, on the one hand, x is going to be in the coset of some power of a. And so x is going to be part of the coset a to the power i, zg, that coset of the center of g. Likewise, y is going to also belong to uh, the coset of zg associated with some possibly different power of a. So y is going to be in the same coset as some other power of a. And that means, therefore, that x is going to be equal to the ith power of a times 
s, where s is some element in the center of g. Likewise, we can write y as a to the power j times t for some t in the center of g. So I'm setting up here this sort of internal times table structure that's the key to our understanding how this all works. And I'm going to use that structure to show why xy must therefore be equal to yx. Well, xy, because I know x is equal to a to the ith power times s, where s is an element in the center of g, I'm going to rewrite x as a to the power i times s. I'm going to rewrite y as a to the power j times t, where t, again, is an element of the center of the group. But since I happen to know s belongs to the center of my group, that means it commutes with everything in my group, which means I can nudge this s past the jth power of a, trade places with this s and this jth power of a, to get a to the i times a to the j times s times t. But this is really friendly because a to the i times a to the j is just a to the i plus j, using general properties of exponents that hold in any group. But now what? I need to somehow get back to the place where I've got y times x instead of x times y. That means I need to get a to the j and t, I need to get those all to the front of the line. Well, I can get the a to the j is to the front of the line pretty easily, just by rewriting i plus j as j plus i and undoing my property of exponents. But now I need to get this t to move all the way out to the front to be next to the a, so, uh, a to the j power. I can do that because I know t belongs to the center of the group and therefore commutes with everything. So I can take this t, I can move it past the s, I can move it past the a to the power i. I get a to the power j times t times a to the power i times s. That's equal to y times x. And therefore, my group is abelian. So the content of this theorem is that if I take the quotient of a group by its own center, that there's no way for that quotient to be cyclic unless that quotient is trivial, and therefore the group is abelian. This, by the way, is another way to show that a group is or is not abelian. If I happen to know something about the quotient of the group by its center, I therefore know something about uh, whether or not that group is abelian at all. In particular, if you tell me that the quotient of g by zg is not cyclic, so if you can find uh, a couple of, uh, of unrelated elements uh, inside of this quotient, then that must have meant that my whole original group was not abelian to begin with. Let's look at a specific way in which we can use this theorem. So let's take the dihedral group of the decagon, so the group of symmetries of a ten-sided regular figure. Um, can the center, if I don't know what the center of that group is, let's ask the question, could that center be isomorphic to z mod 4? We don't know anything else about, about the structure. Let's just try to use this theorem to do so. Well, let's suppose that the center of this group were isomorphic to z4. If that were true, then the quotient, d10 quotient the center, which would be d10 quotient z4, the order of that factor group would be the ratio of the order of d10 to the order of z4. But d10, the dihedral group of the decagon, has 20 elements. z4 has 4 elements. 20 divided by 4 is 5. So if it were true that the center of d10 were isomorphic to z4, then the quotient of d10 by its center would be a group of order 5. The problem with that is that there's only one group of order 5 up to isomorphism, the cyclic group z mod 5. And therefore, if it were true that the center of d10 was isomorphic to z4, that quotient would be a cyclic group. But if that quotient were a cyclic group, according to this theorem, that would have made my original group abelian. But we know that d10 is not in fact an abelian group. Uh, no dihedral group uh, is going to be abelian because tr is equal to r inverse times t. Um, so d10 is not an abelian group, therefore it's not possible for the center of d10 to be isomorphic to z4, because if it were, that quotient would be a cyclic group, and this theorem expressly forbids that, uh, that possibility. So to close, I want to state but not prove uh, another kind of cancellation theorem that relates to different normal subgroups within a larger group. So what this cancellation property says, that if I have uh, a large group G, a normal subgroup H in G, and a normal subgroup K in H, so it's a normal subgroup of a normal subgroup, then the ratio, the, the, the factor group associated with these factor groups, so G mod K mod H mod K, is a group which is isomorphic to G mod H. This is a different kind of cancellation. We've already seen that the order 
of these groups should work out when we talked about um, the indices of cosets. So we know that the index of k and g, that would be the order of this factor group right here, is equal to the product of the index of h and g, the order of this factor group, multiplied by the index of k and h, that would be the order of this factor group. So the orders of elements work out. We saw this back when we first started talking about cosets. What we would need to prove in order to establish this isomorphism, though, is we'd need to show that the cosets of this factor group inside of this factor group behave just like the cosets of h and g do. This is a theorem that we get a chance to meet in our next chapter called the third isomorphism theorem uh, associated to Emmy Noether. All three of the, the isomorphism theorems are, are credited to uh, Emmy Noether, the famous algebraist. Um, so this is a theorem that we're going to get a chance to get acquainted with a little bit later. Um, but for right now, I just want to say it's a different kind of cancellation um, that gives us another relationship among different factor groups.